Uh, in fact, I have. My grandmother was born in Fremantle wow. uh, on my mom's side. And uh, this will have importance to you and any listeners in Australia. But my ancestor is Ned Kelly. You, you're not what? <laughs> How cool is that? <laughs> It's, 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 I mean, like I said, it's one of those things that, you know, obviously in Australia, you know, and for, for anyone that is, if we're already like sort of recording here, for anyone that's in the US, Ned Kelly is like the Jesse James is to the US, Ned Kelly is to Australia. Yeah. Uh, a famous bank robber of the wild, wild west. So, yeah, my grandmother's maiden name was Kelly. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's, it's sort of, and so I got to visit all of them in 1990. I went and stayed for a month with uh, my family in, in Fremantle. Um, and I, I, I haven't been back since, sadly to say. I tried to do a tour there. Uh, obviously, I could tour there now. You guys are, you know, pretty much COVID safe, <laughs> unlike us. <laughs> do it to it. Well, everybody, welcome back to another exciting episode of the Storybox podcast. Today, I'm delighted to welcome Thomas Nicholas to the Storybox. Now, for those of you who don't know who this incredible actor is, you're about to get to know more about him. Fun fact for you, he's the ancestor. His ancestor was Ned Kelly for all those Australians, <laughs> which is pretty damn cool. But for those of you that are in the present moment right now and want to know what he does, he's an actor and a very damn good one at that i watched him in american pie way back when i probably shouldn't have been watching those movies way back when but nonetheless <laughs> he played kevin uh back then he's got a new film called adverse which is a neo-noir suspense drama and a large ensemble cast that includes academy nominee mickey rock and academy award nominee sean austin as well golden globe nominee lou diamond phillips and so many more Thomas, welcome so much to the Storybox podcast today. Yeah, thank you for having me on the show. I'm uh, happy to be here. It's an absolute honor to have the ancestor of Ned Kelly here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to fit that in so many times. You watch. <laughs> you should never. I guess I, well, technically, technically, he's my ancestor, so I would be his descendant. Yeah, so. descendant. Yeah, good, yeah. good fix. <laughs> I, I'm, I mean, I know I'm old now, but I'm not that old. <laughs> I have no one's ancestor yet. <laughs> no, you look very, very young. Um, uh, and I'm, I'm delighted to have you here, man, because like I was saying in the intro, I watched you on uh, the film American Pie and I've seen you in other small films that you've been in along the years too. So I had to speak to you, man. And the first question that I do want to ask you to start things off that I ask all my guests at the start is what does success look like to you? You know, for me, success um, isn't about the destination. It's um, about enjoying the journey mm -hmm. because, you know, no matter, no matter what your goal is, by the time you get close to it, you've already set your sights on the next one. So it's for me, it's all about enjoying the process. Um, and that to me is successful because if you love the process, then you're not forced to go to work. And it's not really work then. When was the moment for you that you realized that success was this for you? Was it this gradual thing over time that you sort of realized it? Or was there a catalyst moment somewhere? You know, it, it's it's hard to say at this point if there was a, a, a particular epiphany moment that I realized that success was about the journey. Um, I think after experiencing that kind of thing that I mentioned where I would get to where I wanted to go. And by the time I was there, I, I wasn't stopping to smell the roses. I was already like, okay, cool. Let's keep going. Um, also, you know, the, the difference between I've learned, uh, after playing, uh, I, I was kind of inspired by, uh, playing Walt Disney and Walt before Mickey, um, mm -hmm. that, you know, the difference between successful people and unsuccessful people is that successful people have failed more times than the unsuccessful people have tried. So I think it's a combination of being a part of the journey and failing mm -hmm. <laughs> at every turn. Because, you know, our life in, in, in business is filled with way more failures and sort of like humdrumness uh, as opposed to the spikes of achievement. Mm -hmm. So when you look back, like we all talk about the spikes and these moments that are great, 
but there's so much in between that we never talk about. Speaking about failures and some of your failures, which failure in, in your life do you remember stands out to you the most that gave you a renewed perspective on life? Um, man, I don't know if, uh, if there's one in particular that gave me a renewed perspective, but I certainly know that I've, I've, I've had my, my fair share of failures. That's for sure. Um, I mean, namely I was talking about, you know, adverse being a turning point in my career and focusing more on drama. Um, of course, you know, uh, tapping into a bit of my ancestry with Ned Kelly, cause my character in adverse is a, an ex criminal, um, who, you know, has Lou diamond Phillips as his parole officer. So I really tapped deep into my, my subconscious there. Um, <laughs> you brought out your in it, Ned Kelly. <laughs> I, I figured you'd appreciate that well, reference thrown in there. Well done. <laughs> it was so, a flying dormant. <laughs> it was, it needed, it needs to be like at least dropped like every five minutes <laughs> one time. Um, so for me, like the, the first failure is when I started out in acting school, I was, I mean, you know, drama was my forte and my acting coach back, you know, this is like the late eighties said, you're only as strong as your weakest link. So let's work on your comedy. Cause it's not good. And from that point forward, I failed at this, uh, particular screen test for a movie called the good son, uh, opposite Elijah Wood. Of course, Macaulay Culkin wasn't at the screen test. So I guess he got hired through some sort of backdoor. I was in like the top three. I don't know if I had the role, but that's definitely a failure. I went from there and booked uh, a baseball film called Rookie of the Year. Mm. Um, and so that was a turning point. And from there, I pretty much stayed in comedy for, you know, 10 plus years. Uh, and now I'm finally back to drama. So there, there's an example of, you know, a failure to achieve the path that I wanted in drama. <laughs> it took a 15 year detour and here I am. Were you ever afraid, man, of being like sort of typecast as this particular character in, in those sort of comedy movies? You know, I didn't uh, suffer that sort of pigeonhole kind of um, experience after the American Pie films. I think it was actually, it, this is what when you get a benefit due to a failure. Um, and I'll try, to, I'll try to make this story succinct. When I did Rookie of the Year, it was very um, overwhelming to get recognition and, you know, sometimes depending on where I was, have a crowd of people form to, you know, take a picture or get an autograph. And at the age of 13, 12, 13, that was like way overwhelming. Mm. So I wanted to focus on the work and not the publicity. From that point forward, I stopped you know, working with publicists and doing interviews as much and just doing the work, which obviously then affected my work in a negative way because you got to advertise business. But one of the, the benefits of that is during American Pie, I didn't hire a publicist. And I think that actually helped me not get pigeonholed mm. because I wasn't going out there, you know, doing more than just what Universal was kind of sending my way. That and also I, I was sort of the straight guy in the in the comedy ensemble. Mm. So speaking about going from comedy and then making the leap to, I guess, drama, was that challenging for you? Um, not entirely because, again, I didn't have the, the nomenclature of, you know, only being known as one type of character. Um, I would say, you know, he's the nicest guy. So I don't mean to like throw my, my fellow castmate, you know, down the river, but Sean William Scott as the role of Stifler, mm -hmm. you watch him in anything else. And it's hard not to see that because it's such a breakout performance and it's synonymous with him. And there are certain actors that have that kind of preconceived idea that when you see them on the screen, all you can think about is that one standout breakout performance. Um, and for me, you know, I was doing other genres uh, in between doing those films like um, Rules of Attraction, which I think it's it's uh, some sort of anniversary. It's a 20 year anniversary this year of the Rules of Attraction and also Halloween Resurrection, albeit not the best Halloween film. Of course, Rob Zombie came and made Resurrection that much better. Um, 
Sorry, Rob. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I was still doing other genres. Um, but I would say that this one, Adverse, is, you know, more true to form of, of my forte of what I, what I came from as far as character acting. I changed the way I look, the way I talked, the way I walked, uh, you know, every aspect about me. And I worked for, you know, a couple of months with, with my business partner and writer director, Brian A. Metcalf, and in rehearsals with my other producing partner, Kelly Arjun. Brian plays uh, Dante in the film and Kelly plays Mia, which is my character's sister that he's trying to save from the dangerous crime syndicate run by Mickey Rourke. Mm. I have quite a few questions coming from this answer that are like spiraling in my head. But the first one that I want to ask you, man, is your, your reason for or why did you want to play uh, your current character in this particular movie? What sort of sparked your interest? Well, I've done a few films with Brian A. Metcalf. And when he wrote the script for this one, we have been doing genre type films. We did a, you know, a vampire horror fl film, a, a drama thriller that, you know, dealt with, you know, the supernatural. Um, and so when he wrote this script, it was more in, like I said, what I, what I love, like the, the drama and character study that I love. And he didn't write it with me in mind. So when I expressed an interest in playing this character, he was like, oh, okay, well we can, do some work sessions and see what you're made of. Cause even he didn't know, you know, my background and how much drama was important to me and how much it was more natural for me. Mm. Um, so what, what drew me to it at first was, uh, was also proving myself, um, uh, proving that I could become this character and, and be outside of myself and make it believable. What was your creative process like? Like, um, and what do you think it means to be more creative or creative in general? Well, when developing a character, I mean, obviously, I, I have, and I'll, I'll get a, <laughs> I, I'll get a little uh, highfalutin, I guess, um, <laughs> when I talk about this, because now you're delving into like you know techniques. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna like sound snobby, but when I, <laughs> when I, when I studied you know, in, uh, as, as a kid, like for 10 years, I was studying in the basis of Stanislavski, which is as most people will know, like method acting mm -hmm. and anyone who studied Stanislavski will call it like, you know, the origination, it's the, it's the first copy of the master of method. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I developed a technique that was in that realm. So when I'm developing a character, it kind of always stems from that writing their backstory, figuring out their upbringing that brought them to the place that they are now, you know, to, to really define how they would decision, do handle decision-making versus myself. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously in a fight situation, I personally would run, but you know, Ethan is not going to run. He's not that guy. And, and what brought him to that place? Uh, the process for this film, Brian A. Metcalf and Kelly Arjun both studied Meisner which is the copy of the copy. Anyone who studied Stanislavski will be like, oh, Meisner's the copy of the copy. See, I told you I was going to get all, you know, hoity-toity. Um, and so I didn't really abide by that, that method, but they, Brian kept infusing it into the rehearsal process and the character development to the point where I ended up with a hybrid of the two, um, which I'm really thankful for. And so now I've, I've actually adjusted my technique for this role and i plan on using that future forward mm. i love this stuff man because i don't know if you can see i'm a huge nerd when it comes to movies i actually wanted to be a, a filmmaker since the age of eight so i love i've worked with actors in the past i've made my own short films so i know all these methods and i've actually worked with a method actor before and i've seen them like there'd they'd be on set and I'd be like, you okay? And they'd be going into the room, they'd do all these like weird noises to get themselves prepared or they hit their head and I'm like, okay, I'll just let them be. <laughs> that is like the weirdest process. I wouldn't do it personally, but if it works for them and it gets the performance out, then why not? <laughs> right. So it, it's just like, I, I find it interesting and fascinating 
um, how actors actually get into, like you think of um, the Daniel, not, not Daniel Craig, the other Daniel, Daniel Day-Lewis, and you look at how he and the stories of him on being on set of movies and how he gets so enamored into that character that he doesn't break character for months until, but then you look at the way it, it comes out on screen, it gets him an Oscar. <laughs> so <laughs> right. it's, it's like one of those things, okay, well, how deep do I really, really want to go into this character? Do I really want to find a different part of me and bring this real character to life? Um, so going back to Adverse for a moment and your character and just being on set, enjoying the moment, all that sort of stuff. What was the, the, the most challenging day for you? Do you remember that just nothing was happening? Did you ever have those days? Um, I mean the, the most challenging days for me on this one and, and really quick in regard to like the, the staying in character for, you know, months I've, I've read those stories about Daniel day Lewis and he's, you know, one of like the, the people whose footsteps I, you know, want to follow in as far as being a character lead. I don't necessarily know that I could ever achieve that. For me, it's always more of like a, of a flip of a switch, uh, which Mickey Rourke was the same way, actually. We would, you know, be doing off-screen banter and he's telling a story about, you know, uh, Robert De Niro or something. And then the camera would roll and he would just turn it on and suddenly be completely different. I mean, 100% everything different sound you know everything that i was doing as well uh and that's i i i understood that part of it of like just flipping that switch and turning it on especially when i'm producing because a lot of times you know when the camera is cut i've got to go handle i got to put on a different hat and become someone else so i'm more schizophrenic <laughs> on a set uh than i am uh you know delving into a character for months at a time um and uh and yeah now i've totally even I, I answered that part of the question and i derailed my own thought process um i totally lost it <laughs> it's all good man i love i love this because it kind of brings up another question we'll get back to the challenge one in a moment because it might tie into it but what do you think separates a good actor from a great actor like the award-winning actors is it that actual method sort of acting or is there something more to it than that? I mean, I think it's, it's kind of like the, the all in, I mean, that was one of the things that, that Brian A. Metcalf kind of brought to my attention. Um, that in fact, you know, I didn't always achieve it. So your, your question before was what was the toughest days? Um, the toughest day that I achieved. And then there's, there's a tough day that I failed at. Mm. Um, the toughest days that I achieved uh, was I'd never cried on screen before. Um, you know, I've I've faked it, I've I've finagled my way through it, but I've never been able to prior to this movie actually shed a tear. And not only did I do it in this film once, I did it twice. Um, and there was there was kind of a, a a respectable moment where the crew I didn't have to ask for their, you know, respect or attention or, or quietness on set because we were all working so hard. They just, it was sort of understood and they gave it to me and they gave me that space and I was able to achieve that moment. And that, that's really based upon all the prep. The one I failed at, uh, delves into what makes a great actor. And Brian was, was, was hipping me to when it, when an actor is in character, it's not just the way they talk. It's mm -hmm. not just the way they look. It's it's every aspect that the emotional standpoint is expressed in every part of their physical being too. So that, you know, if someone is physically angry, they're not gonna be, you know, tapping their foot to a drum beat, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there was, there was one scene in particular where uh, Ethan was feeling and I don't want to give too much away as to why, but he was feeling um, essentially suicidal and, you know, sort of contemplated taking his own life and has this moment where then it's his, his, uh, 
he's not able to do it. And in that moment, in rehearsal, I remember Brian was like, look, your whole body has to be in this emotional place. It can't just be up here. Mm -hmm. It has to be like all the way down to your feet. And I, I'll be honest, I, I wasn't able to, to nail that one and it ended up getting um, cut from the film. Um, and it, it was not for lack of trying, but I just, you know, and I remember being on set with Mickey, every part of him was in character to the point where I remember my wife saw like a, one of the dailies and Mickey's character, um, you know, is going through some things and he walks with a cane. And so he walked with a cane in character so well that my wife said, is he okay? Like, you know, how was he doing like the movie? Like he's obviously not able to walk well. Were you able to film the scenes with him? And I was like, no, no, that that's him in character. He had his workout stuff. He's got like a six pack. He's like lifting weights in between camera setups. You know, he's like massively in shape. So, but when his character had a cane, it's so believable that it fooled even, you know, my wife who knew we were shooting a movie. <laughs> Sorry for the long answer. <laughs> no, I love long answers, man. Uh, honestly, I never learn anything when people, uh, when I'm talking. So you can talk as long as you want. I'll, I'll just listen because I love this stuff. So now you've at least identified why I've never learned anything. I do a lot of talking in my life. <laughs> <laughs> I think we both do <laughs> to be honest. Like I, I try and um, give this, this is a platform for my guests, but quite often I can relate to a lot of things. So then I go off on my own tangent <laughs> Then I'm trying to like bring it back to my guest and say, no, no, this is, this is for you. I feel bad <laughs> after that. <laughs> so uh, well, you've only, you've only gone too far when your guest starts asking you questions. Yeah, that's happened a few <laughs> times actually. And I've just been like, ah, oh, crap. <laughs> How am I going to spin this back to them? Uh, I, need to, I need to learn some more like better interviewing tactics when people do that um, because then I just go off. <laughs> but um, Thomas, do you ever get sick of acting? Do you ever get sick and tired of this, this art form, this craft, of the days that you don't want to do it? And how do you manage those days? If you do have them. Yeah. I mean, for me, um, the, I've always been focused on the process and the work has always been the thing that draws me in that keeps me God, 36 years in this business. Uh, I love, I love the moment of being on set and that actual process like that to me is, is, is the reason for it. it it's the apex. It's the actual creation moment um all the other stuff you know it it exists um much to the detriment of <laughs> of myself but you know the the suckage is finding that work or getting to the point of being on set or at the end of it after you've created it selling that work those parts and even you know directors like Guillermo del Toro has has even you know uh has commented on this, that making a film is the best part, the getting the financing and getting it going and the selling of it sucks. And that I agree with that wholeheartedly. Um, the middle part is so good that it makes me put up with all the rest of it. It's a beautiful moment, isn't it? Like I, I can't really compare that moment of seeing all that hard work over the last couple of months, just really play out the first day on set, like when you get there, even like for a short film, but I've been on like a, an Australian blockbuster film set before and just being there, you're like, you're absolutely in awe. And I guess going back to what I said, it's an uncomparable moment to really anything else in terms of work because you know how much work has actually been put into this behind the scenes to get to that moment in the first place. So, man, I, I wouldn't imagine me doing anything else really that has that same impact. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, no, it, it, it doesn't. Cause like, even, you know, when I'm doing like, cause I have my band and obviously I was talking about the, 
the idea that I almost did a tour in Australia several years ago and still, you know, have hopes of doing that again. Um, but, you know, doing a song like I've got, you know, and I have like a new song that just dropped a couple days ago called Home Life, ironically, since that's what I've been living <laughs> for <laughs> for over, well, almost a year now. Mm-hmm. Um, and so doing that song, it's 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 an easier process. The songwriting you know, can happen in um, anywhere from like 20 minutes to 20 hours, you know, and then recording it is a lot of fun, but you're only working in one medium, which is audio. Mm -hmm. Uh, And even if you're doing, you know, a music video, there's not necessarily a lot of sound design that goes into that. And you're, you're not really working in that other medium. So yeah, a film is, is all encompassing. Um, And certainly being on set, it's, it's kind of like a magic show. There's, it's like smoke and mirrors. It's, the grand illusion, as we say. Um, and yeah, it's, and even on the independent sets, there's something about the energy of so many crew members and cast all focused on the same goal. And there's, there's a lot of power in that. I mean, I think that's, that's one of the main things that we're missing during this, this pandemic is by the separation of us all, the digital connection isn't quite the same as being in person because the energy that exists when people are in the same room together, focused on the same thing, you, you, you can't beat that. Totally agree with you, man. A couple more questions for you, if you don't mind. I don't mind. What would you say out of all the things that you've done is your greatest achievement and why? I mean, are we speaking personally or professionally because obviously i got two kids and if i say anything besides my two kids then uh i what kind of what kind of human am i (laughs) (laughs) yeah true (laughs) but in terms of okay we'll we'll spin it to your working career so you don't feel too bad if you don't say your kids (laughs) but okay so your your acting career your music career all these careers what would you say is your your proudest or your greatest achievement you know, like any artist, um, there, there's not sort of anything that I'm, I'm riding, you know, my laurels off of, uh, for me, it's, it's about you I am always like the most proud of the most recent thing. Mm-hmm. So, you know, in music, I've done six albums. I'm working on the seventh one. I've got songs that are coming out in January and March and April. But man, I can't wait for the one in April because I just finished creating that. So that's the one I'm the most proud of until, of course, I write the next one. And for for acting, it is adverse because that's the one that I've most recently poured my heart and soul and all of my time into. And now I'm, you know, releasing it slowly to the world, uh, one region at a time, but slowly, but releasing it and, and finally saying, hey, this is done. This is what I've created. So for me, it's, it's adverse. Um, and it will be adverse until I create the next one. I love that, man. Where can people, I guess, uh, find adverse? Is it out currently or is it in cinemas? Can they buy it online? Where can they they Uh, find it really? Well, if you're in the States, uh, it'll be in theaters on February 12th. Um, there's a website called adversethefilm.com, which obviously you can see from anywhere. Uh, it has the theatrical trailer and all the the uh, theatrical locations. It'll be out uh, in streaming on March 9th in the States. And then there's a few other regions uh, with different release dates. But we're going to put everything we know on adversethefilm.com. Mm. Um, and obviously the trailer will be there. And and then, you know, hopefully it'll slowly roll out. It's 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 weird you know we can we can zoom across the world but we can't release a film globally i mean unless if you know obviously the studios do that but right but it's you know it's but it's also the regulations of each different country you know there's sort of those firewalls um mm-hmm. that the you know the different governments have we're we're, we're slowly uh weeding that away right yeah i i also have to agree with you on that one and i think the reason why I put up my hand and did the sort of money signal <laughs> was because of that, that very thing. Like it's how much money are we going to make if we release this online? Um, and then I guess 
to knock down those barriers would be more money, more moolah, as they call it. <laughs> oh yeah, more moolah. Hey, well, like like I always like I always say in conversations, uh, if you want to know the truth, follow the money. Exactly. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> um, Thomas, my my final question for you is my all time favorite question. So I I ask everyone at the end. It's a hypothetical one. So I want you to imagine with me for a moment that you've been able to reach the age of 100. You're still quite young at the moment, but just imagine that you've been able to get there and your friends have decided to put together a film or a highlight film, whichever one you want, of everything you've ever said and everything you've ever done. Don't ask me how in the world they got it all. We'll just call it magic for the time being. Uh, but they've been able to get it and show it to you on your 100th birthday. What do you want that film to say and to show about your life? Um, well, I've often, uh, abided by the idea that people will not remember what you said or what you did, but they'll remember how you made them feel. Mm. Um, and in that regard, I've, you know, essentially spent my life creating entertainment, whether it be music or film, whether I'm acting or producing, um, I personally think that entertainment is the greatest form of escape and outside of binge watching, uh, too much of a TV series and too many seasons of it and getting some eye fatigue, uh, there really isn't, uh, any other sort of lasting hangover that exists the next day. Once you've rested your eyes, um, it's, it's not like other substances that we can entertain ourselves with. So entertainment is the safest form of of actual escape or escapism. And so in that regard, you know, whatever is on that film, whatever, whatever moments are there, um, I want I want people to remember how I made them feel. Uh, and and my my entire goal is to make people feel good, which is why I I I strive to be, you know, pleasant <laughs> as opposed to a jerk. Though I can be a jerk, you can ask people that know me well. I've got my moments. Hopefully, those don't make the highlight reel on my hundredth birthday movie. No, we all have those moments, man. But today, you've made me feel good, and you made me laugh. You've given me history. You've given me uh, so much great uh, stories to to spread to my audience. So, Thomas, thank you so much for your time, your energy, who you are, your enthusiasm as well, and for putting out. Such amazing content into the world. Thank you once again for coming on the Storybox podcast. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, besides my my uh, my relationship or or my Ned Kelly being my ancestor, um, I, I might also mention and give some kudos to my uh, my grandmother and who her two sisters, who in the early 1900s were in vaudeville in Australia. So they were you know dancers and singers and um, so you know. I think entertainment is uh, is in my blood and it, you know, I, I guess with my grandmother on my mother's side, does that like somehow make me part you're Aussie. Australian? You're Aussie. <laughs> Am I an Aussie? You're, you're an Aussie, man. Well, 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 we'll just claim you as an Aussie right now, okay? So forget America. <laughs> we'll just say you're, you're Aussie. <laughs> does it doesn't matter where you were born. It matters what's in your heart. Exactly. It matters the <laughs> blood as well. <laughs> so.